ratio into the already overpopular 125cc market. It's a tough task, but Suzuki has it covered, with both bikes arriving with a host of class leading specs. They've got best power to weight ratio, best acceleration, and lower seat height than the Sporty 125 class. And they don't look too bad either. The R and S share many of the same components, but thanks to their different chassis setup offer completely different rides. The R is sleek, sporty, and slung forwards, while the S is more like its naked twin on steroids. Engine. The two share a newly designed 124.4cc single cylinder unit, which makes 14.75 horsepower and 8.5 pound per foot of torque. With curb weights of 134 and 133 kilograms, Suzuki claim they offer the best power to weight ratio in the 125cc class. Power delivery is linear and abundant, reaching its peak at 10,000 rpm. Peak torque, meanwhile, is seen at 8,000 rpm. Even in high revs, this unit keeps on giving, pushing the R to a top speed of 70 miles per hour and the S to 67. Plus, it's frugal, making 122.8 mpg. Combined with an 11 litre tank, there's potential for a range approaching 300 miles, figures we can only dream of on larger sports bikes. Handling Despite that shared DNA, these bikes are polar opposites when it comes to handling. There's a 100mm height difference between the handlebars of the R and S, with the R wearing racy clip-ons and the S featuring more upright set of bars. Both, however, have easy and lightweight steering, making them incredibly agile. The R is just asking to be hugged and lent into bends, and getting a knee down on the bike is surprisingly easy. The S, meanwhile, is like a BMX on steroids. With a 40 degree steering angle and 165mm of ground clearance, you can throw it around like no one's business. A light clutch and smooth acceleration on both models make them an unintimidating prospect to learner riders. Suspension Suspension is well damaged but unfortunately non-adjustable. At 56kg I found it to be the perfect compromise, but heavier riders may wish for some kind of preload adjustability. Admirably, the suspension coped as well on the rutted roads of Buckinghamshire as it did on the smooth surface of Stowe Circuit. Brakes Wavy type brake discs feature front and rear on both models, as does Bosch's ABS 10 base unit. While this has the potential to be oversensitive, Bosch have got the balance spot on, and the ABS is entirely unobtrusive. The brakes themselves are sharp and progressive, again a reassuring factor to entry level riders. Equipment Security appears to have been a high priority in the eyes of the engineers, with both bikes sporting unique anti-theft ignition devices. The GSX-R boasts a wireless fob, while on the S there's a metal plate which slides above the keyhole, preventing thieves from jamming a screwdriver into the ignition. Both bikes come fresh from the factory wearing 17-inch Dunlop D102 tyres, excellent grippy and forgiving rubber. We like the whole package, in fact both of them. Suzuki has launched itself back into the Sporty 125cc class with a bang and two more than worthy opponents to models from the likes of Yamaha, Honda, Aprilia and KTM. The GSX-R 125's aerodynamic fairings, featuring styling cues from the manufacturer's fully grown models, look incredible, especially in the MotoGP colours that we tested. We don't like. A marginally larger tank would make the bikes look slightly less puny, an adjustable suspension would be nice too. Verdict. Both bikes are excellent in their own right and would provide thrills for days. As I said earlier, with 125's this good, who needs a full licence? As is always the case, the naked option promises to be that little bit more practical, comfortable and manoeuvrable. And it's £300 cheaper. A lot of money when you're talking sub 4k bikes. When I was a teenager, I spent a lot of time alone uh, dreaming about, oh, I don't know, Halle Berry, Jessica Alba and various other turn of the century fitties. I also dreamt about motorcycles quite a bit too. I lusted after things like Kajiva Mitos, Aprilia RS250s and Japanese 400s. I had posters of these bikes on my walls. Had KTM's 125 and 390 Dukes been around when I was a teenager, they would have been the stuff of my dreams. The 2017 models even more so than the ones they replace. So for this year, both bikes have been given a significant restart and they now look just like Big Daddy 
1290 Super Duke car with the same sharp, poised and aggressive aesthetic thanks to uh, a new LED front light unit, cowling around the new larger tank which is up to 13.4 litres from 11 plus a sharper tail unit with new subframe which is bolted to a new mainframe. It's premium styling and it makes these two bikes feel much more special, more like uh, big bikes than any of their competitors. Both have also received similar technical changes with engines that are now Euro 4 compliant and tweaks to give them a wider spread of power plus new exhaust silencers on the left side. And they both also feature new suspension with open cartridge WP forks and a new WP shock. But one of the biggest coups for these new smaller Dukes has to be their color TFT displays, which no other 125s or A2 bikes currently have. The display, well, it is unquestionably excellent. It's bright, crisp and clear, easily customizable, and it's a crucial part of what makes these two bikes feel like such premium products. And speaking of premium, that is the territory we're in when it comes to price. So the 390 is £4,599 and the 125 costs £4,099. Let's start with the 125. As 125s go, they don't get more premium feeling than this, but of course, unlike the 1290 Super Duke car, the 125 Dukes 124.7cc single cylinder engine is punting out a lot less firepower. 15 horsepower at 10,000 RPM and 8.85 pounds foot of torque. So that puts it on par with the Yamaha MT125 and as you'd hope from a bike that's mostly going to be ridden by learners getting to grips with a gear bike for the first time. The engine is smooth and predictable with sweet fueling and a nice throttle connection. The power it won't blow anyone's balls off, but it's entertaining enough because you can ride the 125 Duke at 100% without too much fear of reprisal from the law. Launching away from the lights quickly becomes an event to savor. Hold the bike at 8,000 RPM, let the clutch out before quickly grabbing second gear and laughing your head off inside your helmet. Keep the motor spinning between 7 and 10,000 RPM and you're in the sweet spot for making progress. Don't forget to tuck in and crouch down to e -cap every last bit of speed. Braking performance from the ABS equipped uh, radial four piston Vibra caliper and 300 mil disc. Well, it's well up to the job of stopping the 125 Duke with enough power at the lever whenever I ask for it. In the chaos of rush hour in an Italian city, the narrow and nimble 125 Duke is the perfect weapon to cut a path past all those unpredictable, horn-happy Italians. And that's because it's light on his feet, has easy going but sporty ergonomics, and is easy to handle. And when it comes to handling, the little Duke uh, is direct and comfortable thanks to the new WP suspension, which soaks up crappy roads with ease and kept the 125 feeling completely stable. So as 125s go, this is the one that's gonna appeal to young riders the most because it's got the lot, the color dash, scaled down Super Duke looks, upside down forks, cool graphics, and capable performance to match. It manages not to feel like an entry level stopgap 125, and that is exactly what we need to inspire new riders to turn to bikes and stick with them. So the 390 Duke is the same size and shape as the 125, but its additional power makes it feel like a proper little missile in comparison to its smaller sibling. Its 373.2 cc single cylinder engine makes 40 four horsepower and 32.45 pounds foot of torque and that's enough power to swiftly dispatch most city traffic with plenty of go available for fast road rides and about 100 miles an hour on the clocks and with sweet fueling and a crisp response from the new ride by wire throttle it's a motor that's hard to fault keep the engine singing between 6 and 10,000 rpm and the 390 duke is at its perkiest and because it's not crazy fast it can be ridden hard on your favorite twisty road where linking together a series of bends becomes about corner speed selecting the right gear and making sure you do everything right but being correct and precise it's not always fun is it doing skids is and the 390 Duke will happily let you lock the rear wheel up thanks to its Supermoto ABS mode which disables ABS at the rear wheel so on the launch route every tight turn quickly became an opportunity to abuse the tyre and it's a lot of fun. I'm certain that the braking power on offer from the radial four piston Bybury front caliper and 20mm larger front disc has improved compared to the previous 390 Duke. I always felt like I had enough power at my disposal even when things are getting pretty brisk. The suspension feel you get from the 390 is a touch firmer than the 125 so the previous 390 suffered from a shock that's sagged a lot under the rider's weight but the 2017 bike is free from such a problem in fact the new WP suspension is supportive at both ends and responds well when the Duke is being pushed and as with the 125 light and easy handling is the name of the game it's massive fun to hurl into flowing corners and uh, leave around technical turns in the road and the firmer suspension makes it feel more precise and eager compared to the 125 and the new sportier ride position helps here too the new bars put you a little bit more in touch with the front wheel and the rear sets are slightly higher and further back for the most part it's comfortable too, but that seat is definitely on the firm side. So, the 2017 KTM 390 Duke. It's an excellent step on from the previous model. It looks superb and the small changes to its engine, suspension, brakes and geometry come together to create one of the most exciting A2 bikes out there and certainly one of the most fun bikes I've ridden in a while.
Welcome to a rather breezy and showery Lisbon in Portugal. We're here to ride Honda's new CB125R, which is the latest kind of designer Neo Sports Cafe take on the 125 learner market. It's quite an impressive looking little thing. Uh, some nice design going into it. It's got the same design language that it's got on the new CB1000R and the CB300 as well, so it's got the sort of round headlight. Honda's been messing about with this kind of style feel for a few years now and uh, they seem to quite like it. We're going to go, we're going out today, we're going up to Cascais up, up on the coast and then up into Sintra in the hills and uh, we're going to see how she goes. I almost feel sorry for the designers of, of making a 125 nowadays because there's so many restrictions upon them. The big one obviously is the engine, you know, that you've got this massive factory in Japan with all its might, all its computers, all its years of experience and uh, all it can do is make a, an engine that's less than 14.7 horsepower, uh, you know, so where they would normally be looking to, you know, get a massive, you know, torquey, torquey engine or, you know, lots of screaming high horsepower, not possibly do any of that here, you know, they're, they're totally, totally restricted with what they can do. The bike's aimed at learners, so the performance has got to be sort of restricted quite heavily, that's just, that's, there's no way around that for them really. What they can do is, is make it look and, and maybe even ride like you know like a bigger bike, like a proper bike. I mean, I've ridden lots of, sort of learner legal bikes in the past, and you know the suspension, the chassis, the handling—it's all been a bit Mickey Mouse for want of a better term. You know, it's this is—it's not got any sophistication or plushness. Honda certainly managed the first part. You know, the, the CB125 does look like a big bike. You know, I mean, when, when I came out of the hotel this morning, I, I walked over to a CB650 that one of the one of the riders is is, is following us around on today, and you can almost I put my gloves down on that because you know the, the 125s don't look like tiny bikes here. It's all, it's also got the, the new Neo Sports Cafe design language that, that Honda's brought out. Uh, for this bike, for the CB1000R that, that, that we'll be riding as well soon and uh, a CB300 as well which is quite interesting. It, it's a style direction that they've been trialling for a few years now. You, you've maybe seen uh, concept bikes at bike shows that look a bit like this. You know, There's there's a high quality feel about it. There's lots of aluminium sections on the bodywork. It's quite a distinctive round LED headlamp and uh, Things like the frame and the swing arm, they, they look like they've, they've had a bit of thought and design put into them. It's, the weather's pretty ropey today, but there's, there's nothing we can do about that. Get, get the waterproofs on and, and head off kind of thing is, is, is the plan. So get on the CB125, comfortable, you know, the, the seat heights are quite low for my 29 inch inside leg. Nice good quality feel to the dashboard, the LCD dash and the switch, the switch gear. But, a bit sad the front brake lever is, is just a plain non-adjustable one. I always like to see a, a span adjuster on there if, if we can, just for, for different different size hands. The handlebars, it's, it's got a, it's got a sort of pretend fat rental handlebar there. Pillion pegs, the brake calipers, you know, there's lots of nice things on this bike. Pulling away, there's no power, you know. <laughs> That's... If, if you're used to riding non-learner legal bikes, it's always a bit freaky the first time you, you pull away on one. And like, my God, how do, how do people get anywhere on these things? But um, not Honda's fault, again, as we say, but uh, you, you adjust quickly. You know, if, if, if you're like me and you're always sort of keen to be getting on, you just have to basically have full throttle all the time. Uh, change gear with the clutch, don't close the throttle. And uh, every single possible mile per hour you get hold of, just, just keep, keep hold of it, don't let go of any. The, the engine feels feels good for a 125, you know, there's, there's, it's got a, a proper torque curve, you know, sometimes these little, little small engines don't, they're, they're strangled at the top end only, or they're a bit lumpy and bumpy, and this feels almost like a real engine, but, you know, just a, a lot lower down the power curve. Back in the day, 125s, could, could, quite often they were two strokes, and the, the, the way they restricted them could be quite sort of rough and ready. But nowadays, it's, they're all four strokes, they're designed to this power output, there's no de restricting washers to take out the exhaust or anything. Uh, so the engineers can put a bit of effort in to make them sort of perform in a, a more satisfying way, I think that's what they aim for. It's always fun to ride a bike, you know, no matter the motorbike. And there's, there's fun on this bike as well, it just happens a lot slower than a big bike. 
uh, cut through Portuguese traffic. You, you're an advantage here in some ways. You're very, very skinny, slim. You can make it through all these gaps, and uh, you don't have to worry about you know too much power cashing you out on, on the, the slippery cobbles or anything. I'm following Dave Jew, who's, who's the Honda lead rider, and he's in an Africa twin. So uh, it's my bounden duty to keep up with him and show him a wheel whenever I can. So dealt, dealt with the engine there a little bit, you know, but let's have a look at the rest of the bike. CB125, it's got quite wide wheels and tyres for this bike. It's a 3 inch front rim, 4 inch rear rim, and then you get a 110 70 front, 150 60 rear tyre. I mean, almost, almost you might think a bit big for, for a 125, but uh, not the case at all. There's some Dunlop GPR 300 tyres, which working well actually, you know. Uh, Sometimes again on 125s they give you sort of bargain basement tyres from from the bottom of the pile, Bakelite things with no grip at all, but not the case here again, good, you know, a, a decent tyre. ABS brakes on this, you've got to have ABS brakes on everything nowadays pretty much by law, but they've got an IMU unit on this one as well, one of these initial measurement units, gyroscopes and accelerometers. Uh, it's not leaning ABS, which, which I thought it was, it, it's, it's supposedly it's more about tweaking this is a front and back braking bias um, in that sense rather than sort of hardcore performance leaning. Using the brakes, you know, they're decent, good levels of power, a little bit soft on the initial bite but I think that's on purpose in for novices. One thing the brakes do do is show up how good the front fork is and the suspension in general. I mean the front 41mm upside down forks you know, a high specification, and uh, there's a nice, even got a nice Shaw logo embossed in the top top plug. Uh, no adjustment, obviously, but you know, very decent for a 125. And they're actually the same as the ones that are on the CB300. You know, which which, which tells you that uh, they're going to be designed to do a bit more performance than you're going to get with just a 125. We're finished cutting about through town now, heading heading out alongside the River Tagus, Tagus, Tagus. Tagus, Tagus, you see Tagus, I see Tagus, up towards Cascais, which is the, 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 a little coastal town in the outskirts of Lisbon. Really nice place, if you've not been there, get along for a visit, definitely. Uh, we're going to have a coffee stop here and, and uh, squeeze the water out of our gloves because it's still raining really bad, it's horrible. Next stop is into Sintra, and, and it's Lisbon's other kind of chic town, we're going to have some lunch in here. Now, on the way up here, there's some twisty back road sections, and uh, you can have a bit of fun, definitely. I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's twisty, it's nagery, you don't need a lot of power, it's, except when you get up the hill, chasing one Swiss guy up a hill and it was a proper, it was like two HGVs racing up the, the M40 hill disaster. On the way back down the hills again, but you know, you don't need to worry about the power, uh, you can just get on. And then, again, the chassis sort of shows through again, the, 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 those tyres, the brakes, the, the, the suspension, the running gear, you know, I can see why they can use the same stuff in the CB300 because it's, it's, it's going to be capable of dealing with a lot more than the power of the 125 makes. Again, it's the lightest 125 in its class, Honda claims, at just under 126 kilograms wet, and that, you know, you can feel it uh, on, on these beds, you, you don't often ride a bike as light as that. Lunch is finished, we're heading back to the hotel. We go on a bit of motorway for a bit, and uh, always a disaster riding on a motorway on, on a 125. But the one thing you can do is, is take it flat out, see what she does flat out, and uh, we get just about 135 kilometres an hour on the dash, which is like 80, 83, 84 miles an hour. Fine for a restricted naked 125, you know, it's just, that, that's all you can expect, really. Most impressive thing actually is, is the fuel consumption meter, which sounds terribly dull, I know, and I'm sorry. But you know, I, I, I basically had this thing flat out all day. You know, the, the throttle was either uh, closed or 100% all day, and uh, still getting over 100 miles per gallon on, on, on the, the dashboard there. And uh, uh, ridden by someone that's behaving a bit more like a normal human being, it will probably do an awful lot more. I think if, if you were sort of 17, 18, and uh, your, your parents sort of bought you one of these, you would be pretty ecstatic. Definitely so. Uh, it's impressive, it looks good, goes well, and uh, well done Honda. So there you have it then, CB125, tiny bike, looks like a big bike, <laughs> it's, it's slow like a tiny bike, but it handles like a big bike. And uh, if, if you're in the market for 
a quite a posh one to five that, that says that you're a sophisticated kind of a learner chappy or chap s. Uh, get stuck in, give one a go, see what you reckon. So hi guys and girls, it's Harry from VisorDowns.com, hope you're all doing well. I'm out here in not so sunny Malaga in Spain, enjoying the brand new bikes on offer from Kawasaki. So here to my left, we've got the brand new Z125, and to my right, we've got the Ninja 125. So straight off the bat, I'm going to start with the looks. Personally, to me, I think they look great. Kawasaki smash it out of the park on this one. Uh, in terms of riding, in terms of how they feel, again, they've got H2 derived trellis frame, and you can really feel it on the road. So we've been riding around Malaga, mountain roads, a few rough roads as well, a few goats, tested the ABS, and these bikes handle great. So what's the damage? So the Z is coming in at 4,089 pounds, and the special edition is coming in at 4,199 pounds. The price of the Ninja then. So the standard models are coming in at 4,399 pounds, and the special edition black model is coming in at 4,499 pounds. So the first part that I rode yesterday was the Z125. The road conditions varied a bit. So we were up in the mountains on some more rugged roads, real nice sweepers, and it handled fine. And I felt really confident. I say I'm six foot four and this bike felt really comfortable. So if you are shorter than that, again, it'll feel nice and, nice and comfortable to ride. It's confidence inspiring as well. Obviously it's got, it's got, it's a 125 engine. So it's not going to set your world on fire in terms of power but it has the maximum power limit that you're allowed for a 125 and it gets you to where you need to go and it's good fun. The second bike that I rode was the Ninja. Both bikes are stable, but the Ninja just feels a little bit more stable mid corner. But again, where I'm a bit taller, on tighter areas and doing U-turns and stuff like that, it's not quite best suited to me, but that's a very unique problem that you wouldn't experience yourself. So ease of riding, is it easy to ride? In my opinion, yes. So I had to take off my big big bike hat and, and, and think about what a 125 really should be and, and, and how it should behave. In the slow traffic stuff, the clutch is nice and easy, the throttle's nice and progressive, and it's something you can easily get along with if you're, a, if you're new to riding. Also as rider enhancements aids, the ABS I feel is very important on 125s nowadays. Chances are, if you're doing your CBT, you're going to be having a bike that's got ABS. This bike has front and rear, and I'm really impressed with the braking system on them. Now, there are a few bling bits that Kawasaki offer for both the Ninja and the Z, starting with that sports arrow cam. This is something that I'd definitely recommend. On a 125, making a bit of noise, having a bit of presence, you can't go wrong. Plus, it sounds pretty cool. Other accessories include a smoke windscreen, tank pads, pillion seat cover, and also frame sliders. So I think the bottom line is, would I buy one of these motorcycles? Well, if I was new to riding, most definitely. And the choice would be, which one? For me personally, I really enjoyed the, Z, the Z125. I think it's a cracking bike. It's, crack, it's, a, it's, a great, it's great value for money. It's a, it's, a, it's a bit of a deal breaker for me. If you can save a few pounds, this is ideal. But again, both the bikes look great, feel great, feel like proper motorcycles. And as you can see, I'm, I'm very excited because it took me back to the days when I was riding around with my mates, 17, 18 years old, just having fun and all nice and legal. So 
yeah, get yourself to a Kawasaki dealership, book yourself a test ride. Aaron McKenzie from Visor Down, appreciate your time. <laughs>